I want you to turn your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 2, and we're going to continue the series that we have, that, that we've been in, uh, that we just kicked off uh, last week. And for, the, for those of you that weren't here last week, you can go watch the, the message on our YouTube channel, but I'll just give you a quick idea of where we're going. The whole theme of Hebrews is this, Jesus is greater. Jesus is greater. And we're going to be looking at that. And, and along with this, in this, this letter that was written to uh, man, a group of, of probably a, a small home church or collection of home churches, probably in, in Rome, these are Jewish believers uh, who, who had, had fled persecution perhaps and, and now are, are just wondering if following Jesus is worth it. There's going to be a lot of encouragement. But there's also, as we saw last week at the end of the message, some very significant warnings for, for turning away. And, and, and so we're going to talk a little bit about this. And, and so to, to introduce this this morning, you know, I was saying already I've had the opportunity to meet new people that are here for the very first time, and it's so good to, to have you here. But you know, we, when you are introduced or you introduce someone else, like there are different ways that, that that we go about this. You know, uh, well, actually, I'll just show you. Let me just uh, walk off the platform here. I'm going to introduce you to, uh, uh, let's see, stand up. <laughs> Anybody of you ever met Keaton Kilby before? Anybody know Keaton Kilby? Oh, you have, you have like four fans, Keaton. This is great. Okay, so Keaton is, is an intern here at Grace Bible Church. He's been here almost, uh, almost a year, man. That is hard to believe. He, he's an uh, intern with our next gen. Phenomenal guy. Uh, God's using him. I didn't know much about him. I mean, I knew him, but I, I knew he was a truck driver, but we didn't get to hang out as much as we've been able to hang out now. I can tell you a lot more about him. Man, great guy, great speaker. Um, He's single, ready to mingle. No, I, 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 I don't know where that's going, but, um, but so like, like, like if you come up and, and I'm, I'm like, hey, have you ever met this guy? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to introduce you. You know, I want, I want you to know a little bit about Keaton. Okay, I'll let you, I'll let you sit down. David, you're here. Go ahead and stand up. All right, da David Bacon. I've got to know this guy. David, uh, how long have you, you guys been going here? Like two years. Two years. I found out like this guy's a baller. Like it doesn't matter what sport it is. Like in our, our softball league last year, um, he took a few over the fence. Good pitcher, um, but the guy can play basketball. Is there a sport that you can't play? Soccer. Soccer. He can't <laughs> play soccer. But but what I've what I've learned about David and his wife Grace is man they're they're a great couple man they're they're eager to learn to, to dig deep and honestly man if you need them they're, they're kind of people that will step in show up just a great guy can we give it up for David and, and Grace Keaton like well you get the pay. everybody's nobody's making eye contact anymore they're like he's gonna call me out no my my point for this is is like when we. When we introduce someone, we, we don't want you to just know a name. Like, if it's somebody that we know well, we want to make the connection. We want to make sure that you understand something about the person. Now, the Hebrews writer is not necessarily introducing Jesus for the first time because, again, these are Jewish Christians who have believed but now are doubting. In, in essence, what he's doing is reintroducing them, reminding them of who Jesus is and what Jesus can do. And what he does, the, the way he works into this is in verse 5, is he, he's going to make a point about angels, about who we are, and about who Jesus is. In fact, in, in verse 5 of chapter 2, he writes, For it was not to angels that God subjected the world to come, of which we are speaking. It's been testified somewhere, and he's going to quote from Psalm 8 here. What is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you care for him? You made him for a little while lower than the angels. You've crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet. I'll leave your Bibles open. We're going to keep reading, but just a quick note on this. David was the one that wrote these words in, in Psalm 8. And um, what, what, what he's writing is, is something that, that the Hebrews writer wanted to, the, these Hebrew Christians who are living probably in fear, they've had to flee persecution, they, they, don't, they don't have status, they don't have power, they're... they're 
you know, they've been on the run and he has the audacity to tell them, he just reminds them that, no, actually you were created for something bigger than what you're seeing right now. You have a glorious destiny. You were created to rule. And you're like, what? And I would say this, like, it's true of those here. If you're a Christian, you have a glorious destiny. In fact, turn to the person of your right and just look at them carefully. Look at the person on your right carefully. Now, look at the person on your left carefully. What you just saw is a person who, if they know Jesus, is destined to be higher, to be much more beautiful, to have more glory and honor even than angels one day. And you're like, <laughs> nope, did you look who I was looking at? Like, no, I'm telling you, this is right here. But while this was, if you look at Genesis chapter one, our original intention, we were set up to rule, to reign with him. What we read next makes perfect sense. He writes, now putting everything in subjection to him, he left nothing outside, in his, con- outside his control. This next part makes perfect sense to us, especially if you were following what took place with uh, the drones going into Israel, uh, the unrest in the Middle East. We see what conflict is happening. We hear of terrible things that are taking place in our own uh, neighborhoods. Here's what we read. At present, we don't yet see everything in subjection to him. Yeah, we don't see things under control. We don't see everything as it should be. In fact, that's why a lot of people struggle with this whole idea of God. You know, if God is so great, why do bad things happen? If God is is so good, why is there so much evil? If God cares, why is there so much heartache and abuse? And, and the Hebrews writer, while this is not an apologetic to unbelievers, he makes this case that I actually think it is an apologetic. Just because we haven't seen it yet doesn't mean it's not coming. He acknowledges how little control we have here, but then he points us to the one who became man. Look at verse 9. But we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. I I want you to catch something. When I say that we have a glorious destiny, when I say that what we read in Genesis chapter 1, what we read in Psalm 8, what is repeated here in Hebrews, when, when, I, when I read this, what makes this possible is what we just read in verse 9, that a, that a representative of man came forward, and he is the one who is going to, who has made this possible. And if I was introducing Jesus this morning, there are going to be a variety of ways as we continue through this chapter, I I would do this. The first thing that I would say is this, from what we just read, I would introduce Jesus as the king who stepped into our story. He's the king who stepped into our mess. He's the king who showed up when nobody else could show up and do for us what only he could do. Have you ever heard of, uh, there's this thing called, uh, it's, a, it's a, like a social psychological condition called bystander apathy. Have you ever heard of bystander apathy? Um, I didn't hear of a huge, uh, oh yeah, I know what that is. So I'm, I'll explain what it is. It, it's when, I mean, we actually see this, like when there's a whole group around a person that is just getting, just getting brutalized, getting beat, and instead of doing something about it, they're just recording it's, it's when what, what we, it's even happened right here in our own community, which we always think it's happening somewhere else. It's happened right here in Nampa, where kids experience such severe uh, abuse and, and ridicule and, and bullying that it drives them to a place of suicide. And after the case, everybody's like, well, we weren't part of it. We knew it was happening, but, but we didn't step in. In fact, it goes all the way back. The, the, the soci- sociologists started to study this uh, in the, in the mid 60s. There was a case, uh, some of you might remember this. Uh, Kitty Genovese was, was the, the lady's name. She was a waitress in New York City. A guy followed her home. 
uh, as she was walking to her apartment, attacked her, began to beat her, began to stab her. As she screamed, she, had, she was literally surrounded by large apartment buildings, and later it was found that, that people did hear the screams, but everybody assumed that someone else was going to step in and do something about it. Nobody stepped in and did anything. In fact, the guy left her there, came back an hour and a half, two hours later, and raped her and finished murdering her, and still nobody did anything about it. So they begin to come up with this whole, whole thing called bystander apathy. It's where everybody assumes that when something bad is happened, that someone else is going to step in, someone else will get involved, someone else will take the risk, someone else will do something to help. Jesus never suffered from bystander apathy. In fact, what we see here is he wasn't just some ordinary person. Last week we saw that he was the king of kings who, as Paul puts in Philippians 2, he literally emptied himself of, of his glory, of, every, of all the honor that he has in heaven. He took off flesh, became man. He came here and he didn't come at the risk of losing his life. He came here knowing that he was going to give his life. But he wasn't giving his life for some innocent kid who's being bullied. He gave his life for people who deserved punishment. He gave his life for, for people who were sinners. Paul says in Romans 5, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We deserve punishment. But here's what, here's what scripture tells us. Jesus tasted death, took our punishment so we could experience the grace of God. I'm just going to say this as an aside. I think one of the greatest tragedies is this. That Christ did everything that was possible for your salvation. He died, he took your, your, your wrath, he, he died for your sins, he rose for your victory. Literally, he has, he's paid the price for your sin. And one of the greatest tragedies is this grace is available and yet you, you, you showed up, man. You've heard the messages. You show up. You show up to men's group, you show up to services, you show up to all these, these cool events, and yet you never get to the point that you turn to your sins and put your faith in Jesus Christ. You keep trying to show God that you can do this. You can manage your life, you can control your life. And no, the king stepped into our mess to save us from our mess. But he wasn't just the king who stepped into our story We see something else, actually a couple things here as we continue to read. Look look at verse 10. For it was fitting that he, speaking of Jesus, for whom and by whom all things exist, in bringing many sons to glory should make the founder of their salvation, speaking of Jesus, should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. For he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one source. That's why he's not ashamed to call them brothers, saying, I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I'll sing your praise. He's quoting scripture here. Verse 13, again, I will put my trust in him. Again, behold, I and the children God has given me. He's making a point here. There's two more things. If I was introducing Jesus as the Hebrews writer is doing, I want to remind you of who Jesus is. He's not just the king who stepped in the story. He's also the champion who fought for us. I would even say this, who continues to fight for us. This word founder here in in verse 10, like like when he's the founder of our salvation. Like what names come to mind when you think of, you you hear the phrase founding fathers. Any names come to mind? George Washington, like first name, like George Washington. Benjamin Franklin, Thomas Jefferson, John Adams. Like all, all all these names, if you know American history, they're, they're coming to your mind. They're our founding fathers. They're trailblazers. They had done what they did. They had fought what they fought, said what they said, took risks and more. Whether or not you agree with everything they did, we wouldn't be here today. They're our founding fathers. Interestingly enough, the, the word that is translated, the Greek word is translated founder here, like if you have different versions of the Bible, I, I normally teach from the English Standard Version, but if you have maybe uh, an- another version, you'll notice that in other versions, different words are used. Some words, it's captain, the captain of our salvation. Some words, it's champion of our salvation. And, and the, really, this word that here is translated founder, it means just that. It's, it's the one who fought for you. It's the one who, who championed your salvation. 
I know I'm asking a lot of questions today. Uh, a little audience participation here. Anybody ever hear of champion warfare? Champion warfare? It's more of a deal, uh, probably more from the Middle Ages, maybe earlier classic antiquity. It's where two armies would, would uh, prepare to fight, they would gather, and you know, there, there would be this kind of no man's land between the two armies, kind of like what you see in, between North Korea and South Korea. And they would stop short, and every once in a while, they would, they would elect a champion they would elect a, a representative to fight for them. And so there would actually be two guys, one from each army, that literally in this, in this middle place would just go at it, hand-to-hand warfare. And the armies would refrain from fighting. In fact, the fighting was done by these two champions. Think David and Goliath. That's a, that's a picture of this, even though it was more something that happened more frequently in the Middle, middle Ages. I want you to take this picture, two, two combatants going at it. When I talk about Jesus being the founder of our salvation, the champion of our salvation, I want, you to, to take, I want you to grasp this picture of champion warfare where Jesus, the champion, is fighting the champion over here. And what, what does the champion, what, what does Satan have in his disposal? Death. This is what he, what he does. He keeps us in fear of death. Now, I'm going to tell you, like, the younger you are, the more healthy you are, more wealthy you are, life's going good, the, the less you think about death. Let's go ahead and pull a little, pour a little cold water on our thing today. Let's talk about death for a little bit. Like, oh, great, here we go. No, no, listen, listen, as age increases, as your body doesn't do what it used to do, as you experience the tragedy or loss of someone you love, actually, man, if you get word that somebody you went to high school with or went to college with, they died, like all of a sudden, like you start thinking about death. Now, not everybody's as morbid as some where you start reading the obituaries to see if you recognize names. The reality is this, though. You, you start thinking about it because of circumstances that are changing. We're reminded of our mortality. Um, Good Friday, we had our Good Friday services, and so by the time we left, Cole, my 15-year-old son was with me, we left here about 9.15. About three minutes later, we were going down to Lone Star, came to Midway, and um, as we were crossing, come to stop, we are crossing, a lady ran a stop sign and just T-boned us. And, man, we're spinning around, like, I mean, she pegged us, uh, airbags are going off, all of this, and, and you know, as I, I'm getting the car to the, to the side of the, the road, what do you think I'm thinking of? I'm thinking of my son. In fact, it was on his side that we got hit, and so, man, we kind of, I'm like, Cole, are you okay? Like, I mean, his, you know, the doors are caved in, you can't open the doors, airbags, and I'm like, man, are you okay? And he's like, I think so. <laughs> like, you know, <laughs> feel himself, and so he crawls over, we get out, and so we, we step back, and, and by this time, people have, have showed up, and I'm having them check on the other lady. I'm calling the police. Cole is actually cool, calm, and collected. Like, he's taken in, even as, man, they send paramedics, please, everybody shows up. Cole's on the phone, talking to Lori, hey, we've been in a wreck, don't worry, we're okay. Lori shows up, and, and so, you know, the whole process that we're there, it's probably 30, 40 minutes. Cole had gone on ahead. He's sitting in Lori's car. Lori was waiting on me finish with my accident report, and Lori, and, and Lori said that she looked over, and, and Cole had been all cool, calm, and collected, but the adrenaline was worn off, and he said his eyes were kind of filled with tears, and she's like, are you okay, man? Are you hurting? He's like, no. He said, it's weird. All of a sudden, I just started thinking about what could have happened, and that night, we got home, and I said, bro, listen, man, that, that's a, a legit thing. I said, but every time you think of what could have happened, just remember what Jesus did to protect you. And then I went to bed, and you know what I thought about? I thought about what could have happened. <laughs> and literally, what, what, what you begin to think about things, you, like you don't think about it until something shakes you, and you're reminded we're mortal. It's weird, the more we try not to think about it, the more we think about it. The more, you know, the, the longer we live, the, it's, it's weird. It's like the faster time goes by. Have you noticed that? Like the older you get, like, like you get what James wrote in James chapter four. Life is a mist. You're here today, you're gone. 
And, and you're reminded of, so what we try, we try to deny that, that we're mortal. We try to lie to ourselves that, that we're, not, we're not getting older. The death is not creeping up on us. Like if, if, you know, if you, know, you get to a place like you don't have what you thought you, you, you should have at this place in life, you get desperate. If you're single or you got issues in your marriage, you get really desperate. If, man, you're, you're, you're getting older, you're, you know, your guy, that's why you have like midlife crisis, you go out and buy a car, you probably don't need that car. Or you start like unbuttoning your shirt down to your navel, like, dude, you're not Tom Selleck, stop, <laughs> stop. Or like ladies start getting surgery or start wearing clothes. You get it. You get it. No, the reality is we, we try to lie to ourselves that, that, that I'm, I'm going to escape this. But dude, it, it's, death is coming. Some of you, like I've talked, talk, like, like we begin to think about what am I, what's my life been worth? What kind of legacy am I leaving? We just had our staff retreat this past week and I, I can't remember what I was talking about. But in the middle of what I was talking, the thought hit me and I shared it. I said, man, there's coming a day. I know what it was. We were just saying, this church is not about us. It's not about me as a pastor. It's not about anybody. If we try to make it about us, dude, it's a joke because there's, I told her, so there's coming a day when I'm going to die. And the reality is this. A lot of people who want answers from me, want to sit down. I get the compliments or get the complaints or whatever. There's going to be very few people that come and leave flowers on my gravestone. The reality is, even the people that we're closest to, how often do we go out? We... We're forgotten. And I don't say that. It's just, it's just this truth. And so this, this fear of death, this, this shadow of death is a real thing. And there can be this fear. And I guarantee you, as, as a Hebrews writer, he's writing to people that have been persecuted. They've been running. They don't have status. They don't have anything. And, and yet he's, he's reminding them of this. And Jesus is the one that started this. He is the founder. He's the champion. He gives them good news in their crazy world. And I'm telling you, it is still good news in our crazy world. Our champion took our greatest fear, death, and he put it away. He did it all by himself. And here's how he did it. He continues writing. Here's how he did it. Look at verse 14. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, speaking of Jesus, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. What Jesus did on the cross was he broke the chains of fear. He died for us, and in dying for us, in rising for us, he gives us hope that there is more than this, that there's more than the fear of the grave. There's more than the fear of death. He gave us a hope that when I'm officiating a funeral, I think of, man, the Burkholz family who we prayed for literally for years. We prayed for this little four. He ended up turning five-year-old boy. That God would do a miracle and heal him from this cancer. I believe that God could do it, but God did not do this. And this is what allows me in this funeral to look at a grieving family. Yes, there is grief, but I can say there is hope because Jesus destroyed Satan and broke the hold of death. When I officiated the, the funeral of, of Tony McCreary, who, led, uh, who gave the announcements, his, his sister, my cousin, when I officiated her funeral, man, we cried. We grieved. But here was the thing. We didn't grieve as those who have no hope because Jesus, our champion, defeated death once and for all. Man, for those of you that have, I guarantee you there are people in this room, you have, you have suffered from a miscarriage. You never got to hold that baby. Maybe there are some of you that you have such great regret for having that abortion, for, for what took place. And, and man, there's this, this, this deep 
pain and this deep sense of loss. Listen, by God's grace and because of the champion defeating death, there's going to come a day when you're going to get to hold that baby. Can you imagine walking into heaven and seeing the child you lost fully grown, having become everything and more that you had hoped they would be? Man, there are people who have suffered. There are people who have suffered. They, they have not had uh, good health or they have not had the things that we, the physical things that bring comfort or whatever. They've not experienced. All I know is that the deprivation that we experience here, the suffering that we experience, it is not ultimate. The partial things that we miss out here will be experienced in fullness in heaven because our champion defeated death. He defeated sin. He defeated Satan. This is our champion. This is why the Apostle Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 15, death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where's your victory? Oh, death, where's your sting? I would add disease. Where's your finality? Disappointment, failure, rejection. Where is your devastation? Loneliness, where's your bitterness? Look at verse 57. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is a champion who saves us from death by his death. He is our champion. But he's not just the king who stepped into our story. He's not the champion who fought for us and defeated death, hell, and sin. I want you to look, go back to the verses that we read. Look at verse 11, 12. Jesus is the brother who's not ashamed of us. I think we can skip over this really easily when we're reading through Hebrews. For he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified, have, they all have one source. In other words, both the one who makes men holy and those of us who are being made holy, we are of the same family. This is mind-blowing right here. That is why he's not ashamed to call them brothers. Any of you have a weird family member that you're kind of embarrassed of? <laughs> You know, like when you were dating and you took your date home, you're like, okay, listen, weird uncle so-and-so are going to be there and just, just watch out. They're just weird. By the way, if you can't figure out anybody, you're the weird one. I'm just telling you, that's the way it goes. I want you to think about this thought. What the Hebrews writer is writing, man, to people. Dude, there. They have no status. He's like, Jesus Christ is not ashamed of you. He's not ashamed to call you brothers. Your faith, man, you might think it's little. You're, not, you're asking those questions. He's not ashamed of you. Here's the thing that's crazy. We're those weird family members. In, in the sense that Jesus came, he took on flesh, he became man. He... He went through what we went through, but here was the, here's the only difference. He did it without sin. If there was anybody who should have the ability to be condescending and uh, look at us and say, get your act together, you group of failures, it should be Jesus. Does he do this? No. What did he do? He died for the sinner. He died for the failure. He died for the outcast. He died for the shame, the rejected. He made possible our salvation. And when we believe on Jesus Christ alone for salvation, when we turn from our sins, we turn to faith in Christ. He not only forgives us from our sin, he not only gives us the power to follow, he not only gives us the hope of eternal life, he gives us something else, and that's this great confidence that Jesus isn't going around in heaven saying, oh, dude, oh, I, wish I'd never, I wish I'd never brought those guys in. Oh, dude. I, I need to go back to John three sixteen. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever except for this dude, like, I, he's not doing this. No, not at all. Not at all. And, and these, these people needed to hear this, and there's probably somebody here that needs to hear this. This is a group of people, again, and I keep coming back, it's so important, they're transfixed by the fear of death. 
They feel so alone. Listen, they, they were raised, man, they were raised as a good Jew. They were raised going to the temple for the big festivals. They were raised in the synagogue. They, be, they believed the rituals. They heard, the, they heard the, the prophecy that a Messiah was coming. They believed it. And somewhere along the line, when they saw Jesus, so they heard the message of the cross, what he did, they believed. But now, man, they're so transfixed by the fear of death, feeling so alone, they're tempted to go back to the rituals. Uh, maybe it's not, maybe Jesus wasn't enough. Maybe I need to have this as well. I need to go back. There aren't as many of us in our little home church as there used to be. My friends, some of my friends have gone back. They needed to hear this. It's not just that Jesus was the champion who made possible the salvation. It's that Jesus Christ is proudly affirming his solidarity with them. I'm not ashamed of you. Man, don't you see where we got nothing? I'm not ashamed of you. You're my brother. You're my sister. And there's a comfort here. But there's this comfort that I think turns to confidence as, and I'm only gonna introduce this because this is gonna, this last portrait of Jesus that we have is one that we're gonna be talking about for the next couple of weeks. It's so powerful. But look at verse 16. Man, if you need confidence, this is it. For surely it is not angels that he helps but he helps the offspring of Abraham. He's saying to these Jews, you were elected as the people of God. And God's not forgotten you. I would say this to you here today. Man, you were chosen by God. You're not a Christian by by accident. Listen to me. God's not forgotten about you. It's not angels he helps. He helps the offspring of Abraham. Therefore, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he's able to help those who are being tempted. What we see is that Jesus Christ is also the priest who can help us once and for all. You know, it's hard to think about this. We have something that the angels don't have. The gospel. Peter says in 1 Peter 1 that the angels long to look into the gospel. Why do they long to look into that? Yeah, maybe there's an element of understanding, but there's also this sense that, going back to Psalm 8, that God puts such high value on his creation of humanity that we're of great value. Jesus Christ did not die to save angels. He died to save sinners. Humanity. (laughs) You remember that show, uh, Touched by an Angel? Anybody ever watch that, Touched by an Angel? Like, Lori and I, I don't even remember when this was, I don't even remember when it was on, it's just been forever. I think on Sundays we would watch uh, that show. Here's the deal. I bet in heaven there is a hit show called Touched by a Human. All the angels are like, hey, get the popcorn, man. This is amazing. I love what's getting ready to go down. <laughs> See, angels get this. I don't think we do. Jesus came and he didn't just come to die and be the sacrifice. He came to be our high priest. Now, because we don't think a lot about the background, and we're going to dig deeper into this in the weeks to come, we miss on the significant. The, the main duties of a, of a priest were to intercede for the people that come to them. They, they, they would stand almost in the middle between, uh, between the people who are coming, who have a need, and God. They were, they were representatives to the people of God, representatives uh, for the people to God. And we looked last week like... like we, when they should have, in fact, just in my devotion this morning, I was in Deuteronomy reading, the priests, if you were on duty, you stood. You stood by the altar, you're constantly offering the sacrifices. But you're offering these sacrifices on behalf, on behalf of the people. You went to a priest if you needed help. And what's being introduced here is something that we're going to keep digging into. Jesus is a greater high priest. And I'll just give you a few reasons and then we'll, we'll get into this next week. First of all, he's a greater high priest because he understands what you're going through. There, there's absolutely nothing 
that you and I have gone through that he hasn't, he's, he's not been in our shoes. When you're praying, to, when you're praying, that's what you understand. When it talks about Jesus interceding for us, your intermediary, your high priest that is taking you before the Father is someone who gets exactly where you have been. He knows temptation. You're like, yeah, but he never sinned. Like, he doesn't know. No, hold on a second. You know who, fe- who feels the full weight of temptation? The one who never gives in to it. Like, we feel a little temptation and we give in. You know who felt the full weight of temptation? Jesus. I've always said, you know who the strongest person in the gym is? The person who felt the most weight. He knew temptation. He knows what it's like to be tired and hungry. He, hangry. He, he knows grief. He knows what it means to weep. He knows betrayal, rejection. His own family, if you read in Luke, they, they thought he was crazy. They said he's insane. He's out of his mind. He knew disappointment. He gets it. Like, he has faced what you face. But it's not just that. He, he knew that there had to be a perfect representative. He knew what you and I needed, and he was the only one that could step in and do this. He took our place. He took our punishment. And I, I think there, there's a time when, we, you know, we don't always think about what Christ's suffering for us means. There are times when we go through pain and suffering, we immediately go down the checklist. Well, let me see what sins I might have committed. Let me, let, let me see where I might have failed. I'm probably going through this because God's mad at me. If, that, if you are that person, you literally need to stop. There's nowhere in Scripture that supports that, that, that type of thing. Well, I guess if, if, I'm, if I'm facing hard times, then, you know, I, I was in a wreck. What did I do wrong? No, listen, I'm going to tell you, like, if, if you're always going around as a Christian thinking that God's mad at you, you need to start looking at the cross. Because while I don't understand what is happening, why pain and suffering happens, why bad things happen to good people, I don't have all of those answers. What I can tell you is this, I I can't look at the cross and say that God's mad at me or that he doesn't love me. Literally on the cross, Jesus took the wrath that I deserved, that you deserved. He took our place so that we could be saved. We could be accepted. We could finally experience the love that we all long for. He he became our representative. But, you know, the last reason that I was thinking about as I was doing sermon prep this week, the reason he's a greater high priest is because He made possible our victory through what he did as our representative. Remember, the priest, human priest, stands the whole time they're offering sacrifices. Last week, what did Jesus do when when he ascended to heaven and took his place at the right hand of God the Father? He sat down. And he sat down because he finished what he came to do. His work is finished. He made possible your victory and my victory. What this means is that if you are in Christ, if you have turned from your sins, you've trusted in Christ for salvation, you've been saved by grace through faith, here's what you can know. Your guilt is as far as you is from the east as from the west. That's scripture, that's, I'm quoting from Psalms there. You can know that your victory over the power of sin is just as secure as Christ places at the right hand of the Father. You can have this confidence. You can have this assurance because Jesus never fails. He's never going to fail as your high priest. His work was perfect. His work was enough. That's why we're going to see in Hebrews 7, 25, we can know that we are saved to the uttermost. It's Jesus that's doing the saving. My parents years ago used to sing a song, Jesus is right for whatever's wrong in your life. And you know what? The lyrics to that song are so true this morning. A lot of times we're looking for something. Maybe we don't understand what's going on. Maybe you're like this group of Jewish believers huddled in a home church. It looks like you're dwindling in people. You're dwindling in resources, everything else. What's going on here? You, you might be looking for something new. I need a new command. I'm going to, you know, I, I'm going to try harder. I'm going to do more. I'm looking for a new mo- willpower, a new motivation, a new self-help book. No, I, I just say this. Jesus is right for whatever's wrong in your life. What you need to do is look to Jesus, a, a savior, a priest. He's your help. He's your trust. He's your refuge. Years ago, I read a book by J.D. Greer. 
And in it, he, he had this quote that I think is just is so good. He said, religion takes a look at your problem and tells you to do better and try harder. But the gospel, the story of what Christ did, our human condition and then what Christ did, the gospel tells you to look upon Jesus and what he's done. It makes a difference. Look to Jesus. I can introduce you to Keaton. I can introduce you to David. I can go around and introduce you to several people by name. I can tell you who they are. I can tell you what they've done. But the greatest thing I will do here this morning is introduce or, for the struggling Christian, reintroduce you to Jesus, the king who stepped into our story, the champion who fought for us. You catch that? He fought for you. He, defi- he defeated death for you. The brother that's not ashamed to call you brother, to call you sister. The high priest who can help us once and for all. You and I need help. Look to Jesus. And Father, as we come to the end of the service, I want to thank you so much for the hope that we can have Thanks to who Christ is, thanks to what Christ has done, thanks to what Christ is continuing to do. And Lord, I don't know here, I don't know who might be here today that needs to be introduced to Jesus, but God, I pray that if they have not already experienced this, that today, man, they can meet with our prayer team here at the end of the the service. Everybody can leave, they'll come up here, we will pray with them. And, And God, I believe that you, that today can be the day of salvation for them. But God, there might be a person or persons We need to be reminded of who Jesus is. And Lord, I'm praying that they would understand that Jesus is our king, our champion, our brother, our high priest, and what that means and who he is, it matters. May you change your perspective. So God, for what you're gonna continue to do in and through your people, we'll thank you for this. And I pray this in Jesus' name. And all God's people said? Hey, before you head out, I would say this. At the end of every service, we have a prayer team. They'll, they have red, yeah, there you go. Steve's standing up here already. He's got a red lanyard there. And if, if you just need prayer for anything, or if you want to meet Jesus, come on up. We'll stay as long as it takes. Take advantage of that. Show up tonight. If you haven't already been to Next Steps, 5 p.m., first class. We'll see you then. You're dismissed.